What? No, that's fine. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for being here. It's my pleasure to uh, do this presentation. Uh, the topic of my presentation tonight is, of course, uh, Marc Antonio and Muñoz Marin. Uh, Marc Antonio, Vito Marc Antonio was, of course, a congressman from uh, New York. He represented the district that uh, included El Barrio, the Puerto Rican El Barrio. Muñoz Marin, of course, uh, in 1948 became the first uh, elected governor in, in Puerto Rico. Now, if you were to, uh, to be in 1949 and start doing um, an analysis of Puerto Rican politics in, in that year, you would say that the relationship between Marc Antonio and Muñoz Marin was a very confrontational one, a very acute one. Uh, Muñoz Marin accused uh, Marc Antonio during the 1949 uh, mayoral election here in New York City. He accused Marc Antonio of being a communist. Uh, Marc Antonio uh, was a critic of uh, Muñoz Marin's economic and political proposals at the end of the uh, 1940s. He called Muñoz Marin the Nero of Fortaleza and characterized his main economic development project, which is called really, really Operation Bootstrap. Marc Antonio used to call it Operation Booby Trap. Now, Things were not as confrontational uh, always. We will go back to the mid-1930s where the relationship between these two political leaders, uh, representatives of the Puerto Rican community, both in Puerto Rico and here in New York City, the relationship between these two was fairly cold, cordial and also uh, Collaborative. That mean they engage in a common, in common political action uh, in favor of Puerto Rico and of Puerto Ricans here in New York City. What is important in studying the relationship of these two uh, political leaders is, of course, how it reflects on the political developments in Puerto Rico and in the United States, and basically how we had to redefine what is meant by Puerto Rican politics. That is, we cannot uh, limit our understanding of Puerto Rican politics basically uh, looking only to those events that happen in the island of Puerto Rico. Even by the 1930s, we had to expand our perspective and definition of Puerto Rican politics to include events, processes, and relationships that were happening here in the U.S., particularly in New York City, uh, and specifically related to the Puerto Rican community here in the U.S. The other thing I would like to discuss <coughs> in my presentation, towards the end of my presentation, is of course the nature of the conflict between Marc Antonio and Muñoz Marin. It is usually uh, agreed by most uh, academics dealing with the issue of, of Puerto politics and the very few that deal with the relationship between Marc Antonio and Muñoz Marin, that it was the issue of independence what uh, uh, confronted both politicians. That is, Muñoz Marin, once a supporter of independence by the late 1940s, had abandoned the idea of independence and, of course, was supporting what came to be the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. Uh, on the other hand, Marc Antonio remained as a staunch supporter of independence, although that is true, and that is indeed an element we have to consider in understanding the relationship between these two politicians. I will argue that 
perhaps the most important element uh, to explain the attacks by Muñoz Marin and the Puerto Rican government against Marc Antonio uh, in the late 1940s was the issue of Puerto Rican migration, specifically the role played by Marc Antonio in the Puerto Rican community here in New York City and the whole uh, process that by then the Puerto Rican government was engaged in, in trying to promote migration from Puerto Rico to the United States, particularly, of course, here to New York City. Uh, the, the relationship uh, of Marc Antonio with Puerto Rico could be dated back to when he was elected for the first time. Uh, in 1934. His electoral district included uh, El Barrio. Now, uh, during the first years, the relationship between Marc Antonio and Puerto Ricans was not very, uh, very cordial. One of the first things that Marc Antonio uh, uh, did was to support statehood for Puerto Rico. He made a public pronouncement in favor of statehood. Now, that wasn't really, really what people in El Barrio were expecting of Marc Antonio, since, as uh, um, many scholars, including uh, Jerry Meyer, who has done a, an extensive work, uh, he's one of the main biographers of Marc Antonio, <coughs> the only of the Marc Antonio biographers that has really studied uh, Marc Antonio's relationship to uh, the Puerican community. At that time, El Barrio uh, was uh, heavily uh, 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 supporting independence. Now, by 1936, Marc Antonio changed his position, and Mayer, Mayer argues that since then, uh, the support of the Puerto Rican community in El Barrio for Marc Antonio also increased. Now, the first uh, relationship for Marc Antonio with Puerto Rico, with the island itself, came in 1936. Uh, in that year, uh, Marc Antonio submitted his first uh, pro-independence bill in reaction to another independence bill uh, submitted that year by Senator uh, Tidings. Now, that bill was punitive. It was to punish Puerto Ricans. That is, it, it was a, an independence that would break all relationship between Puerto Rico and the U.S. Mike Antonio submitted a much more progressive and favorable a bill for independence. In that year also, Marc Antonio went to Puerto Rico. By the way, that was the only trip that Marc Antonio would ever make outside of the continental U.S. He went to Puerto Rico to assume uh, the defense for the Puerto Rican Nationalist Party leader, Pedro Albizu Campos. Albizu Campos had been accused of sedition in the federal court in Puerto Rico. Uh, during a first trial, he was, uh, uh, he was not found guilty. Uh, now the government submitted the same charges again, and he was found guilty. Marc Antonio went to assume the defense for Pedro Albizu Campos. Uh, while in Puerto Rico, Marc Antonio was received as a head of state. Many people went to the airport to greet him, and uh, the, 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 the government of the capital of San Juan uh, uh, greeted him publicly in front of the, uh, the San Juan Plaza. Now, this is important because it would really define Marc Antonio's relationship to Puerto Ricans and to political forces in Puerto Rico. Since then on, he would be a supporter of Albizu Campos. And also, it would uh, set the relationship of Marc Antonio with the other counsel for Albizu Campos, who happened to be Gilberto Concepcion de Gracia. Concepcion de Gracia would later become the president of the Puerto Rican Independence Party. Uh, by the way, uh, Marc Antonio's independence bill in 1936 
was very, very progressive. For example, it included a, a, an indemnization for Puerto Rico. That is, the U.S. was to pay Puerto Ricans for all the exploitation and all the profits that the U.S. and American corporations had taken from the island. It also included a clause for free trade between Puerto Rico and the U.S. after independence, and very importantly, remember this is 1936, a clause to guarantee the continued entrance and the free flow of Puerto Ricans from Puerto Rico to the U.S. and from the U.S. to Puerto Rico. Uh, now, interestingly enough, although Muñoz Marín opposed the Tidings Bill, he did not support uh, fully uh, Marc Antonio's bill. There were many factors for that, uh, particularly the conflict between Muñoz Marín and the president of the Liberal Party, uh, Antonio R. Barcelo. But anyway, since then, since 1936, what we see is a relationship between Marc Antonio and Muñoz, a political collaboration that will last until the mid-1940s, 1946, 1947. Now, there were several issues where Muñoz Marín and Marc Antonio would collaborate during that time. One of them, perhaps a very important issue uh, after the mid-1930s, was the campaign to oust, to get rid of perhaps one of the worst governors appointed by uh, the U.S. government in Puerto Rico, the, uh, the terrible Blanton Winship. Now, Winship is best remembered in Puerto Rico because during his administration, the, uh, the both the federal government and the Puerto Rican government launched a campaign against the Nationalist Party. It was during his term as a governor that, uh, I'm sorry, that Adviso Campos was jailed. Also, it was Winship who gave the order to the police to shoot at the Nationalists marching peacefully in Ponce in what became in March of 1936, uh, in what became known as the Ponce Massacre, where the police shot about what, 20, 20 something, right? 20 something nationalists, unarmed nationalists in the town of Ponce. Now, both Muñoz Marín and Marc Antonio uh, joined in the fight to get rid of Winship. Uh, Marc Antonio even went, even went so far to criticize President Roosevelt. I mean, and this is the, uh, the very ironic thing. A liberal president appointed a very reactionary governor. Uh, and Marc Antonio kept saying this to President Roosevelt. Eventually, by 1939, uh, Winship went, uh, was removed from the position. And most of the progressive and liberal forces in Puerto Rico acknowledge the central role played by Marc Antonio in this process. Uh, the other thing that's important to keep in mind during this period is that by the late 1930s, Marc Antonio had turned into perhaps Puerto Rico's real representative in Congress. And let me explain this for a few minutes. Since 1900, uh, Puerto Ricans have a representative in Congress, which is called the Resident Commission. Now, this is kind of a territorial delegate when the U.S. had territories. He cannot vote. He cannot speak. Well, he can speak, but you know, nobody really cares. But uh, now, in the late 1930s, what is ironic, the resident commissioner for Puerto Rico was the president of the Socialist Party, Santiago Iglesias. Now, I'm, I say it's ironic because this is the period where the New Deal was being implemented in the U.S., and some parts of the New Deal were being extended to Puerto Rico. 
what is ironic is that you have the president of the Socialist Party opposing the extension of many measures, of many policies implemented by the New Deal in Puerto Rico. So Marc Antonio had to assume the role of representative not only of Puerto Ricans here in the U.S., in New York City, but also the representative of Puerto Rico. He submitted many bills in favor of Puerto Rico of the workers in Puerto Rico. So that by the early 1940s, workers throughout Puerto Rico were calling Marc Antonio the real representative of Puerto Rico in Congress. Okay? And this is a very important issue to remember. Marc Antonio always argued that he had two constituencies. The people that voted for him here in New York, in El Barrio, and the people that could not vote for him, they couldn't vote for anyone here in the U.S., but had no representation in Congress. So, for all purposes, Mike Antonio became the congressman of Puerto Ricans, both in Puerto Rico and here in New York City. Muñoz Marin acknowledged this. And through the late 1930s to approximately 1945, he would be going continuously to Marc Antonio to get bills in favor of Puerto Rico, including the minimum wage, uh, workers' compensation laws, laws to uh, uh, make Spanish the, the, the language of education. Remember that even at this time, English was the official language of education in Puerto Rico. The extension of the social security uh, uh, law to Puerto Rico, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And there are many instances where Muñoz Marín acknowledged the role play, the important role played by Mike Antonio in this process. Uh, I won't bother you with that. So, yo, Another issue that linked Marc Antonio and Muñoz Marín at this time was, of course, not only the defense of the New Deal in Puerto Rico, but also the defense of the governor of Puerto Rico since 1941, Rexford Guy Tugwell. Now, Tugwell is an important character in this story. Uh, Tugwell was one of the um, uh, uh, one of the people that devised the ideas of the New Deal in the U.S. He was very liberal, and in 1941 he was appointed governor of Puerto Rico. Now this is important because since 1900, the appointed governor of Puerto Rico. Remember that. Puerto Ricans were to elect their own governor in 1948. So at this time, the, go the president still appointed the president, the, the governor in, in the island, and the governor could veto any bill presented by the legislature. Now, the Populares won in 1940, but if the governor would to be opposed to any of the reform bills presented by the Populares, they would have who had not been any social or economic reform at all. So it was in the interest of the populares to defend Togwell. Now, as we know, Puerto Ricans do not elect anyone here in the States, okay? They could be, you know, uh, they could be influential in some sense with some politicians here in the U.S. but. Perhaps at the beginning of the 1940s, the most important uh, politician in Washington supporting not only the social and economic reforms presented by the populares, but also supporting Governor Tugwell was indeed Vito Marcantonio. So at this time, we see a very collaborative process between the reformists. Uh, Muñoz Marín and the progressive Vito Marcantonio. Now, what about independence? 
independence would be an issue indeed that would create conflict between these two politicians. But until 1945, independence was not really a contentious issue between Marc Antonio and Muñoz Marin for several reasons. For one, it was not until 1945-1946 that Muñoz would abandon his support for independence and, of course, uh, start to support what came to be uh, the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. Now, during the war period, Marc Antonio, who always supported independence, argued that, well, during the war, we will support independence, but our first priority is to defeat the fascists, okay? And in fact, he had some arguments with the nationalists. Not that Marc Antonio would abandon his support for independence, but because the Nationalist Party in Puerto Rico, in, his, in their idea that, well, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, were not supporting the U.S. in their fight with Germany. And Marc Antonio really opposed that idea. His argument was that for independence to be viable in Puerto Rico, the Allied forces had to win the war. Now, the war ended, and many things changed regarding independence. For example, in 1943, uh, the independent forces, in reaction to another tidings bill for independence, created what came to be known as the Congress for Independence. That is, all the supporters of independence, irrespective of their political affiliations, would come to this Congress. Now, in reaction to the Second Times Bill, Marc Antonio submitted another independence bill, similar to the first one, very progressive, very favorable to independence. The populares really pay no attention to this. In 1945, Tidings again submitted another bill. Now, this one is different because instead of being for independence, it would for the first time include the three alternatives, statehood, some kind of self-government, and independence. Now, the Congreso, the Congress for Independence opposed this bill. Marc Antonio once again submitted his own independence bill. And the populares, well, the populares say, well, things have changed, we have to move along. And by 1946, we start seeing a real change in Muñoz Marín's position and also the Popular Party position. By 1946, Muñoz Marín and the Popular Party would abandon definitely the goal of independence and start to promote another alternative, which came to be uh, the Commonwealth. Now, what happened was that in 1946, Muñoz would expel the independentistas from the uh, Partido Popular, from the Popular Democratic Party, that is, the Congress or the Congress for Independence would leave the, the, the Popular Party and they would create the Puerto Rican Independence Party. This party was presided by Gilberto Concepcion de Gracia. This is important because, of course, Humberto Concepcion de Gracia was Marc Antonio's closest ally, closest Puerto Rican ally, not only in Puerto Rico, but also here in New York City. Okay? So the relationship between Marc Antonio and Concepcion was not only political, but also a very personal relationship. By the way, Marc Antonio was uh, Concepcion de Gracia's daughter's uh, godfather. Godfather, ¿verdad, padrino? Yeah, uh, Godfather. Alma Concepción, Arcadio's uh, wife. Uh, so the relationship between these two, between Concepción de Gracia, the president of the Independence Party, and Marc Antonio was a personal relationship also, which in fact would endure until uh, Marc Antonio's death in 19, in 19, uh, in 1950. Now, yes. The issue of independence was indeed 
an important issue in the conflict between Marc Antonio and Muñoz Marin. That's true. But I argue that that's not the whole picture. Okay? That the main issue that led the uh, Muñoz Marin, that led Muñoz Marin and the Popular Democratic Party to attack Marc Antonio in 1948, 1949, was the issue of migration and the role played by Marc Antonio here in New York and in the United States. By 1947, the conflict between Marc Antonio and Muñoz Marin and the Puerto Rican government was obvious. Marc Antonio opposed the three most important uh, reforms or measures uh, promoted by the Puerto Rican government then. Uh, the Economic Development Program, Operation Bustra, as I mentioned, uh, my, my canton used to call it Operation Buitra, but it was meant that this program was nothing else than selling Puerto Ricans to Wall Street and to American corporations. Uh, my Antonio would also be critical of the political reforms being proposed by the populares in Puerto Rico and by the U.S. government here in Washington. One, the bill to provide uh, the election of the Puerto Rican governor, which it happened in 1948. Antonio did not oppose that bill, but argued that that was basically a cosmetic reform to the colonial regime in Puerto Rico. And since 1948-49, Mike Antonio became the most staunch critic of the process and the project and the bill to turn Puerto Rico into a commonwealth, which happened in 1952. Mike Antonio's argument was that, of course, commonwealth was nothing else than the continuation of colonialism by another name. Now, yes, Mike Antonio opposed all the important policies presented by the Popular Democratic Party. Yes, but that's not enough to explain why would Muñoz and the Puerto Rican government, why would they go after Mike Antonio with such, uh, such a bigger, I mean, it was really, really uh, mean. Uh, in terms of the campaign against Marc Antonio. And as I mentioned, that had to do with the Puerto Rican community here, the issue of Puerto Rican migration. We have to remember that Puerto Rico's migration law, Puerto Rico's migration policy, was also enacted in 1947. In 1947, we had two important bills, two important laws. The Economic Development Law, which launched Operation Bootstrap that was approved in 1947. And in December 1947, the government approved the migration law. And basically, what the migration law stated was that, one, we will take charge of the issue of migration. Okay, the state, the government will play a central role, okay? in what Michael Lapp calls managing migration. Basically, we will promote the migration of Puerto to the United States, okay? Also, that law uh, includes, well, includes two uh, government institutions. One in Puerto Rico, the so-called Bureau of Employment and Migration, which tells, tells a lot. If my employment is linked to migration, you know, you don't have to be an Einstein to understand what's going on. While in New York, the government will open the so-called migration division. While from Puerto Rico, the Bureau will encourage Puerto Ricans to migrate, to migrate to specific locations, by the way, out of New York the Migration Division will be in charge of helping Puerto Ricans in the incorporation and assimilation into American society. 
Now, it, it is this last issue that will confront the government with Marc Antonio in several ways. Why? Once the government decided that migration will be the mean to solve the economic and social issues in Puerto Rico, and you have to remember, they approved an economic development law. And immediately they approve a migration law. What's the meaning of this? Well, we know that the economic development law will not will not provide all the jobs that we need. So if you want to provide social and economic stability, the mechanism to do that would be to push Puerto Ricans out of the island. And that's precisely as we know what happened. Okay? Now, what's the problem here? In 1947, before the government decided on the issue of migration, people began to move, quote unquote, spontaneously to New York City. A big migration. There, was, there were no jobs in Puerto Rico. The situation was critical on the island. So people began to move out of Puerto Rico and come coming to New York. Now, the result of this process became known as the Puerto Rican problem in New York City. A devastating and extensive campaign against the entry of Puerto Ricans was launched here in New York City. From the right to the so-called left, or oh, well, the liberal press represented by the New York Times. That is, a very fierce campaign against Puerto Ricans developed here in New York City based on the assumption that they were a problem for New York City. A problem because they had no skills, there were no jobs, they went to overcrowded neighborhoods, they were linked to drugs, delinquency, they came here to take welfare. And perhaps what the government of Puerto Rico thought of the most damaging issue of all, they were linked to Vito Marcantonio. And why was that a problem in 1947? Well, things changed a lot during the 1940s, well, from the 1930s to the 1940s. During the 1930s, having a progressive politician in New York, yeah, yeah, we can handle that. But after the war, remember that 46, 47, we will have the beginning of the Cold War. McCarthyism will be coming in a few years, okay? So the nation is moving towards the right. New York City is also moving towards the right. And having a quote-unquote communist as a representative of New York City in Congress was not, you know, really a good thing for New York City. Now, if, as the argument went on, if that congressman was being elected by Puerto Ricans, that's even worse. Okay? And that became the centerpiece of the whole Puerto Rican problem campaign. Puerto Ricans are coming here not only to create social and economic problems, but they are a menace, a political menace to the well-being, to the political well-being of New York City. And of course, remember that by the end of 1947, the Puerto Rican government had decided to promote migration. Now, what could they do to promote migration. Well, they had to deal with the Puerto Rican problem. And for that, they engaged in several policies. For example, they would finance, they would subsidize the first quote unquote scientific study on Puerto Rican migration to New York City. That study was published in 1950 under the title of the Puerto Rican Journey. Perhaps those of you that know about Puerto Rican migration could be familiar with that name. 
the head author is none other than C. Wright Mills. For those of you that know something about sociology, you know, that's the radical sociologist of the 1960s. Yes, his first real publication was dealing with Puricans, something which I think he <coughs> didn't publish <coughs> uh, quite openly. Anyway, uh, the government of Puerto Rico financed that study. It was called the Puricans study by Columbia University. Okay? Uh, so they were engaging in uh, openly in, uh, in policies, in actions to uh, uh, deal with the Puerto Rican problem. Let me jump quickly. Uh, of course, to deal with the Puerto Rican problem, they engage Mark Antonio. And the best example of that is the role played by the Puerto Rican government in the 1949 mayoral election in New York City. In that year, Mark Antonio ran under the American Labor Party as a candidate for mayor of New York City. What happened was that the Puerto Rican government, in trying to separate the Puerto Rican vote from going to Marc Antonio, launched a campaign, a well-financed campaign, to attack Marc Antonio and promote the Puerto Rican vote towards the Democratic candidate, the uh, mayor, uh, William O'Dwyer. Uh, the other thing that the, uh, uh, the Puerto Rican government did is that the vice mayor, and the mayor of San Juan, I mean, if you know about Puerto Rico, you know that San Juan is the capital of Puerto Rico. It's, you know, at that time, as of today, you know, it was a big, big, you know, government structure. Now, the vice mayor and the mayor, which happened to be sisters, the mayor of San Juan was uh, Doña Felisa Rincón de Gautier, the vice mayor, you know, her sister, Fini uh, Rincón. Finn Rincon stayed here a whole month, the whole month of October, doing campaign for the mayor of New York, and of course doing campaigning against Marc Antonio. The mayor of San Juan came here for two weeks, two weeks, to campaign for O'Dwyer and to campaign against Marc Antonio. Now, the end result of that was, of course, that they not only engaged in New York politics, but Doña Fela, as she was commonly known, also engaged in anti-independence politics here in New York. Now, on the other side, Gilberto Concepcion de Gracia, the president of the Independence Party, came here to support Marc Antonio. And, you know, while in New York, he also took the opportunity to engage in anti-Puerto Rican government and anti-Commonwealth politics here in New York City. So what you have here in the streets of New York in 1949 is a very peculiar, relation, a peculiar process where Puerto Ricans were not only engaged in New York City politics, but at the same time they were also being engaged in Puerto Rican politics at the same time. So it was extremely linked in, in that occasion. Uh, uh, Marc Antonio, of course, lost that election by a wide margin. Uh, the irony is that uh, although O'Dwyer won the election, and next year he was yeah, I mean he was he had to resign because of corruption charges. Uh, now, uh, Marc Antonio lost the election in 1950 for the simple reason that the three dominant parties made a coalition against Marc Antonio. And once again, like in 1948, 1949, in 1950, the Puerto Rican problem became an issue that was launched against Marc Antonio. At this time, the situation became more acute when, the, in October, the Nationalist Party tried to uh, launch an attack against the president. One of the, uh, the nationalists involved was none other than Oscar Collazo. Oscar Collazo had worked at the Harlem office of Congressman Marc Antonio. Uh, so finally, Marc Antonio was defeated, and the government of Puerto Rico 
could occupy the role being played by Mike Antonio then. The Migration Division and the Puerto Rican government became the representative of the Puerto Rican community here, and also they would engage in the defense of the migrants coming to the United States, a role that Mike Antonio had played before uh, 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 before 1950. Uh, let me just mention one thing about what the great uh, Puerto Rican intellectual Arcadio Diaz Quiñones calls the broken memory, the memoria rota. If you look at Muñoz Marin's memories, he had two, uh, memoirs, I'm sorry, he had two, um, a two volume memoir. Okay, volume one and volume two. There's only one mention of Marc Antonio in two volumes. Basically saying something about the independence bill he promoted in 1943, saying, you know, these independentistas, they wanted to work my promise with the government, blah, blah, blah. Two volumes. There's no mentioning of Marc Antonio. By the way, in two volumes, there's only one mention of migration, Puerto Rican migration to the United States. At the end of the second volume, two sentences. That's what Arcadio Diaz Quiñones called the broken memory. Those issues in Puerto Rican history that were obscured in the official history of Puerto Rico. Puerto Rican migration, at least until a few years ago, used to be one of those uh, elements of the broken memory. Within that very dark room of our broken memory, Marc Antonio is even more forgotten than the migration itself. So uh, this is my presentation. Thank you for, uh, do you have any questions or comments? Professor Guerrero. Yes. Uh, thank you for the provocative uh, discussion. For some of us who are not familiar with this, uh, I appreciated your attempt to tease out the complexities of this uh, story. Um, what I wanted to be, what wasn't very clear to me was uh, what was Mark Antonio's attitude to migration policy. It wasn't very clear to me what well, became an issue for him in between both parties. Yes, that, that's a very good question. Can you repeat the question? Here? What was um, Mark Antonio's attitude? to the government's policy on migration in 1947 that led to the big conflict between uh, Munoz and uh, Antonio. Very good. Uh, Mark Antonio was critical of the government's migration policy. Basically, his whole argument was that independence was the only alternative that could produce a viable and sustainable Puerto Rican economy so that Puerto Ricans would not have to migrate to the United States. Now. Once they had migrated, they had to be protected from being exploited here in the U.S. as cheap labor. And throughout his uh, engagement with Puerto Ricans, that's precisely what he tried to do. Uh, it's interesting that the Puerto Rican government would end doing what Marc Antonio was doing, that is, assuming the representation, quote unquote, and the protection, quote unquote, of Puerto Rican migrants here at the U.S. Uh, for many years, Marc Antonio was the only, uh, not only institution, the only person uh, uh, trying to protect Puerto Rican migrants here in the U.S. The great migration chronicle, uh, Bernardo Vega, called him uh, the champion of Puerto Ricans, el, el campeón de los puertorriqueños, because really, for many years, particularly during 1947, where the, uh, the, the, the attacks against Puerto Ricans were so fierce, the only person uh, trying to protect and defend Puerto Ricans, uh, Puerto Rican migrants here was really Marc Antonio. Yes. Um, I have a question about the 40, the election for mayor, the campaign for mayor. 49, yes. Yeah, because um, the numbers of Puerto Ricans who had settled here were not that huge at that point from the post-war migration, and the numbers from the settled population before weren't that big either. 
And I'm wondering how you would balance the sense that the Puerto Rican vote could have really mattered, actually, or how much this was just a whole PR thing, as they often had to deal with the whole question yes. of packaging and presentation, and, and how were they really worried about the vote? Um, because after all, Marcantoni was more popular in his district, and Puerto Correct. Ricans were spread all over the place. So. Correct. So, and if, and if it was more towards the PR thing, how would you kind of discuss that as, who are they presenting it for, in a way? If they're not really persuading the Puerto Ricans as much, they're trying to show to other people that were respectable anti-communists. Correct. Who, who were they playing? I think, it, 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 yes, that's a good question. I think it was uh, both. There's a PR element to the, to the whole campaign. Uh, the government was really trying to impress the establishment here in New York City and in the U.S. in terms of claiming that, well, Puerto Ricans are not supporters of communists, okay? We will go against Marc Antonio. We will prove our anti-communist credentials. Now, in, on the other hand, there is uh, also, uh, there are electoral considerations, although, as you mentioned, the Puerto Rican vote was not as great. It was a close race for O'Dwyer and the uh, and the Republican candidate. So any vote that Marc Antonio could take away from O'Dwyer would be helpful to, to, to O'Dwyer. Uh, so in that sense, O'Dwyer had an interest in uh, getting support for the Puerto Ricans. By, by the way, in, on, on September 1949, O'Dwyer would create the mayor's, uh, how was it, the, the mayor's committee on Puerto Rican affairs. And for the first time, the mayor of New York would acknowledge the presence of Puerto Ricans, and basically that committee would engage in uh, providing aid and help to Puerto Rican migrants here in New York City. So, in a sense, it, 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 it begins uh, the acknowledgement of the political establishment here in New York City of the Puerto Rican community. As you said, Puerto Ricans were moving out of El Barrio, to other parts of New York, particularly to, to the Bronx. Uh, but El Barrio was very significant because it was still the center of the Puerto Rican community here at the U.S., at the, uh, uh, New York City. By the way, Muñoz, uh, Marc Antonio won El Barrio, okay, in 48, 49, and even on 50 when, when he lost his, uh, his, his election. So, uh, yes, I think it was part PR. Uh, but also there were some electoral considerations to, that we have to consider too. Yes? Yeah, I, I think it's understandable that uh, being so early would have favored statehood because it was a progressive response to the colonial status yes. uh, of uh, Puerto Rico. And as a matter of fact, Eugene Debs, I think, uh, campaigned for Puerto Rican statehood in, in Puerto Rico. Yes. And Celso Lagosa, the father mm -hmm. of, of statehood, uh, in Puerto Rico, uh, was a socialist. Today, they I wouldn't say I wouldn't go that far saying he was a socialist, but uh, yes, for many progressives, the idea of statehood for Puerto Rico, you know, uh, extending them full right, but and all the other things, is an acceptable idea. Now, uh, I don't go. In, uh, I didn't go into that in my presentation, but if you go to the Marc Antonio files. There's a lot of documentation of people from that community reacting to that, reacting fiercely to that idea. And basically, as Meyer argues, uh, the support for independence was very, very strong at that time in, in El Barrio. So in a sense, I think uh, uh, Mike Antonio reacted to that. But also, I think he came to, uh, to support the idea that as an anti-imperialist, uh, given the people of Puerto Rico, which he argued was a nation, uh, independence was the, uh, the, uh, the, the alternative to support. Uh, and he died supporting independence. <clears throat> Yes. What was his relationship to the Communist Party of the United States or a Socialist Party? Marc Antonio? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you have to get a Marc Antonio biographer for that. It's very complex. Uh, some people argue that he was, how you call that, tapaito? Uh, by, uh, huh? 
a fellow traveler for the for the Communist Party. Macantonio, as far as I know, never acknowledged that he belonged to the Communist Party. Now, the Communist Party supported him. Now, Macantonio was related to the American Labor Party, which is a different story. Uh, but as far as I know, he his relationship to the Communist Party is very, very tenuous. He, he he got the support of the communists, that's true. But he also supported the election of the African American yes. members of the city council. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. And he gave, uh, he supported uh, Roosevelt's uh, New Deal for, yeah. I don't know if he has the poll tax. At a time when there were too many representatives that were doing that. Mm-hmm. Yes. He was a progressive in the widest sense of the, of the word. At that time, yes. Yes. Why was the socialist leader the IGSS opposed to the extension of the um, New Deal to Puerto Rico? <laughs> That's a good question. That's very complex, too. Uh, in 1932, the socialists. Uh, why would the socialists in Puerto Rico oppose the New Deal? Uh, the short answer. To the, my short answer to that is, is politics. In 1932, they created a coalition with the Republicans. Now, the Republicans in Puerto Rico were the same, the same ideology as the Republicans here in the state. It's very strange, yes. Uh, and the coalition won the elections in 32, 36, and 1940. So, uh, what they did is the Republicans would take charge of the legislature in Puerto Rico and they would give the resident commissioner to the socialists. So, you know, it's like a candy uh, to a kid. Yeah, go to Washington, you know, stay there and uh, do whatever you can. Basically, what uh, what the people that have studied that that relationship has argued is that it, in, 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 in trying to maintain the coalition, the socialists would abandon really their socialist positions and end up supporting the Republicans' uh, uh, positions, that is, opposing the New Deal in Puerto Rico. It's very strange, very, very strange. Uh, so the end result was that Marc Antonio ended up being the only supporter of the New Deal in Puerto Rico in, in Congress. Very strange, yes, I know. But many things in Puerto Rican politics are very strange. That's not the only one. And probably it would not be the only one in years to come. One comment, one comment. Uh, for me, as a as a listener, you know, I don't know if you did this uh, in your in your in, in the uh, chapter, but I think for, for me as a listener, I think you need to um, tease out much more fully the position of Antonio to migration, since migration is the issue around which mm-hmm. you this, this thing, you know. It didn't come out clearly to me, but okay. actually, for expository purposes, you know, and for readers, I think that should be dealt with much more clearly. Okay. So to be clear to all that that is what the issue really was. Very good. Senators and members of Congress, 
So I was wondering what the position of Mac Antonio. Precisely because they were yes, that's true. Because pre precisely because they were more conservative, and, and during the late 30s and 40s, uh, Muñoz during that time had to rely on on Mac Antonio. Okay, uh, we have read a lot about Muñoz's supposed relationship with insiders in, in, in Washington, particularly Ruby Black, which is true. Uh, but you know, Ruby Black might have access to the White House, but in Congress, it's a it's a different story. So basically, what happened during this time until 1945 is that. For all purposes, Mike Antonio became the most outspoken representative for Puerto Rican issues in, in, in Congress. Uh, now, you, you, you have to remember that until 1946, when uh, Jesus T. Piñero was appointed governor, the governor, well, the governor was appointed by the president, and they were all American officials. Uh, how many interests they would have on Puerto affairs, um, you know, it's, it's very difficult to ascertain. So basically, you could not count where the governor to be representative of Puerto interests in, in Washington. So that, I think that's also an, an issue why Mike Antonio became so important during this period of the late 30s and, uh, to the mid-1940s. Yes, you had a question. That were actually leaving in Puerto Rico feel towards Mark Antonio, towards the ending of like during their elections. Like, how come they didn't vote? Because usually lost by the question. Ah, yes. What's the relationship of Puerto Ricans in Puerto Rico? Like the Puerto Ricans in Puerto Rico with Mark Antonio, because then he lost by such a wide margin. It seems like no one, none of them are supporting him. And no, but you have to remember that uh, the Puerto Ricans voting for Mac Antonio are those in New York. Okay, he was the congressman for El Barrio. Now uh, the the thing is that because of Puerto Rico has no representation in Congress, Mac Antonio had to assume that role. Uh, uh, that is being a representative of Puerto Ricans in Puerto Rico. Okay. Uh, Macatoyo had support among Puerto Ricans in Puerto Rico, and there is a very, uh, 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 very large documentation in, in in several archives, including the Macantonio files. Uh, in fact, Meyer uh, quotes several people that came to New York and immediately became supporters of Macantonio because of the things he had done for Puerto Ricans in Puerto Rico. Okay. One of the accusations against Marc Antonio, by the way, was that he was the promoter of Puerto Rican migration because he wanted Puerto Ricans, they are U.S. citizens in 1917, to vote for him in New York City, which is kind of ludicrous, but that was one of the main accusations by the right against him during that time. So, yes. How old was he when he died, and what do you think would have happened if he had... Oh, Marc Antonio was in his 50s, right? He's very young. Yes, yes, he died of a heart, a heart attack, uh, which is strange. Uh, there is this gossip columnist in the, it's kind of the Daily News at the time, I don't remember the Daily Mirror, I think it was, that when Marc Antonio died, he made a column, you know, wow, thank God he died. And among the worst things that he criticized Marc Antonio for was not that he was a communist. It was that he promoted the immigration of Puerto Ricans. I mean, we could forgive him for being a communist, but not for, you know, bringing Puerto Ricans to New York. Uh, so he was a very controversial figure here in, in New York City. Uh, but for many Puerto Ricans at the time, uh, he was the real representative of Puerto Ricans, both on the island and here in New York City. Do you have any speculation of what he might have done if he hadn't died so soon? He was going to run again for his district. Yes. Unfortunately, he died. Yes. Uh, See. Si. Um, thank you for your presentation. I, um, you know, it was interesting that to know that also at that time um, 
Yes. So he would get the support of the Italians as well as Puerto Ricans. So the Jewish sector in Nevada, mm -hmm. I'm not too sure where that was progressive, but they are already starting to migrate. Uh, but the, the uh, one thing that I'm, I'm uh, interested in, in asking with regards to, uh, there's also someone who actually has uh, done some very uh, naive paintings about the whole period, uh, Ralph Pasanella and, 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 and Lucky. Corner, which is about 116th mm -hmm. Lexington, where they used to have the big rally. Correct, uh, yes. The, uh, during the election uh, day, and then to wait the results. So, uh, so there's a whole memory of, of, of Victor Marc Antonio among our uh, uh, este, abuelos, you know, mm -hmm. and our you know older parents. And, and the name was actually given to many Puerto Ricans who were born in New York. I have a cousin whose name is Mark Antonio, and there's somebody called Mark Anthony who sings quite a bit around here, right? Yes, yes. You know, and all of that can be referred to Mark Antonio. But I'm interested in just asking because it's a question that I haven't had a chance to uh, to, to look at. And um, it uh, when Mark Antonio became closer to Concepcion de Gracia, mm -hmm. happened when uh, Gilberto came to this country to study and to support, uh, you know, to, to present the visa. Uh, the uh, and uh, what happened, you know, and, um, um, and Concepcion was also close to Alviso at that time, right? Uh, but then the, 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 uh, their uh, strategies and their uh, uh, vision of struggle uh, started to move mm -hmm, in different mm -hmm. uh, directions uh, with regards to the independent issue, independence issue, right? Uh, so, so I know that my for the relations between Mike Antonio and Alviso. Alviso was here in 43 for three years. Yes. He, he became ill in, in jail, mm -hmm. tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to say it, but I think it's, it's nothing to, to, to be ashamed of, right? I mean, he was not treated very well in the prisons. It happens to political prisoners. Uh, but then I'm not too sure what, what might have happened between the two of them. Do you have any idea? Well, as, as far as I know, uh, Marc Antonio always uh, supported uh, Alviso Campos. Not that he agreed with his ta tactics. I think he was closer, of course, to Concepcion's uh, tactic of the electoral process. But uh, nonetheless, he always supported the state. For, uh, uh, Alviso Campos, for example, when Alviso got out of jail, he came to New York and he was given help uh, by Marc Antonio, okay? Uh, he was very sick at, at, at that time. Yes, so as far as I know, Marc Antonio never rejected Albizu, although he, he disagreed with, with Albizu's uh, tactics on, on, on armed struggle. Uh, but well, definitely, yes, he was closer to, to Concepcion, uh, politically and, and, as I mentioned, uh, personally, personally, too. By the way, uh, there are records that Marc Antonio gave some a few sentences in Spanish in the lucky corner. Yeah. He, you know, he tried to appeal to his Puerto Rican constituents. Of, of I'm sorry? But he could, somebody identify some footage of Marc Antonio when he gives speeches at the knocking corner, and, and, uh, and maybe some of that is Spanish. Is in Spanish yes, in yes. Find to, to locate it, right? Thank you. I just wanted to say that, uh, you know, I was raised in El Barrio. Mm -hmm. uh, we came on, in 1947, and uh, Vito was uh, a very beloved person in, in our home. Um, and, you know, my parents uh, were also part of the Puerto Rican Independence Party. Um, and so, you know, we thought of him, we, we loved him, we loved what he did, uh, and, we, and we supported him, and I would, I would hear my father say that Vito was for us, the Puerto Rican people, what Adam Clayton Powell was to the African American people in terms of standing up for civil rights in Congress. Uh, you know, that, that there was that, that analogy and that feeling that we had our voice there uh, through Vito. Mm -hmm. Want to share. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, I think there's some beverages and food over there. They might not be, but anyway, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you.